Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Pike County Library Lecture Series. Um, I'm Kristen Muller. I'm the director of Peters Valley School of Craft in Layton, New Jersey. And um, we every year offer immersive learning workshops, which this year we're doing virtually. And um, we have a gallery and we have an upcoming virtual craft fair, October 10th and 11th. Um, and we're very excited to see you here tonight. Um, we have this wonderful lecture series that we do in partnership with the Pike County um, Library and Pike County Library is in Milford, Pennsylvania. And uh, we were generously funded by the Richard L. Snyder Fund and the Greater Pike County Community Foundation a couple of years ago to start an artist lecture series and we have been inviting artists from all over to um, present their work. And typically it happens in the library, but because of COVID, we can't do that, but it's out, opened up a bunch of possibilities for people to um, present and also for people to chime in. So we've got people from Los Angeles. And if those of you that are um, uh, on in the chat, if you wanna type from where you're um, tuning in from, we love to know that information. Um, and we just find it really exciting. So tonight, um, we welcome Carolyn Herrera Perez, and Carolyn um, is our guest curator for our an emerging curator for Peters Valley Present, which is um, a retrospective exhibition that was supposed to happen at the Ensica Conference, which is the National Ceramic Education Council of America um, conference that was supposed to happen in Richmond, Virginia, and. Um, was canceled due to the pandemic, um, but is going to well open this Sunday via virtual um, presentation at Peters Valley on our website. And we are going to be hosting the opening next Wednesday. So I wanted to get that out of the way. Um, I wanted to let you know a little bit about Carolyn. She identifies as she, her. She is a researcher, writer, and maker based in Peekskill, New York. She's a current curatorial fellow at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. She's pursuing her master's of arts in history of design and curatorial studies at Parsons and Cooper Hewitt. She previously served at various nonprofits, art nonprofits in education and ceramic research. Herrera Paris first studied art history and ceramics at SUNY Potsdam and has previously been a ceramist and studio assistant at various ceramic studios. So she's going to tell us a lot about her creative journey from maker to scholar. And um, I just wanted a little housekeeping. If you have questions, for those of you that are not familiar with Zoom, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that there's a chat function. And we're going to be posting information there, like websites and Instagrams. But if you have questions, if you could put them into the Q&A um, when we're done with the presentation. We will ask some of those questions. So um, welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll start screen sharing. Thanks for welcoming me, welcoming me and everyone. It's so nice to see you here and see friendly faces. All right, let's take a peek. That's not the beginning. All right, how's that, Kristen? Perfect, I can see you beautifully. Great. So, um, hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn Herrera Perez. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I wanna thank you all for joining me. Uh, when I first agreed to deliver a presentation to you all, I thought that it would be in person. And so much has sh just shifted since then, and despite the changes, I'm really happy to be here tonight actually think that this pivot has developed a new appreciation and new opportunity for the exhibition that I curated, um, Peters Valley Present. So there's been a lot of shifts since the pandemic started. The show was originally to be held in March a few months ago at NSICA in Richmond, Virginia. Um, in case you're not familiar, NSICA stands for the National Council of Education and the Ceramic Arts. And for me, it felt um, pretty kismet. If you know me personally, I've gone to the conference pretty frequently since I started studying ceramics as a maker 
and then studying ceramics as a researcher. And I think for a lot of clay people, going to Enseca can be quite a game changer. And it was for me. And when I originally saw the call for emerging curator to collaborate with Peters Valley, as they were celebrating their 50th anniversary, I was like, I have to apply. And thankfully I was, I was chosen for the position. I'm so thankful for that. And so Peters Valley Present it reacts to the last two decades of ceramic programming designed by Peters Valley ceramic head, uh, Bruce, Jen, uh, Bruce Denner. He's also an artist and maker himself and a ceramist. Inspired by the school's summer course offerings and catalogs um, that I had the great privilege of going through while I was at Peters Valley, um, the exhibition shares many approaches to the medium. This exhibition appreciates a myriad of ceramic making methods and 29 artists are in the exhibition. And I was specifically interested in Bruce's time and programming at Peters Valley because, well, um, I found it just really dynamic and I knew that it would be, well, at the time I thought at least it would be shown at Enseca. And with the, that came hopes of attracting those who have never visited Peters Valley. And my goal was to have a summer course catalog come to life. And I also hope that those who had instructed, assisted, just been a part of the community that is ever growing uh, at Peters Valley um, would also feel reconnected with the school once they were there. And part of my choice in choosing the artists that I did comes from a place of, uh, well, once being a ceramist and maker as well. And I think that some of my favorite writings and interpretations about the medium comes from ceramics. Um, I think that curating the show, I also wanted like this sense of wonder to be about and that potential that is also so apparent in flipping through the summer session catalogs like I just showed or um, the things that are ever abundant and lush about the environment. And at Peters Valley, you can consistently see how every week, every class, a different maker is bringing their respective point of view, approach, and technique to the studio. But what is staying the same is this thoughtfulness and, and surrounding that, you know, Kristen offers and Bruce Denner also, but all of the wonderful people at Peters Valley who have really welcomed me as well. So the show, it displays a survey of work across clay bodies, firing techniques, surface treatments, and concepts. Um, but I would like to suggest that the show is a bit of a love letter to the potential that makers are tapping into at Peters Valley and also to the instructors that have been a part of the Peters Valley community. Um, a few weeks prior to the conference and exhibition opening and, and to keep all safe at the first approaches of the, this pandemic, the NCCA conference was canceled and the exhibition was postponed. And now the show convenes in a different way and not in a physical space, but in a digital one. And, you know, despite the associations that, that one might glean from ceramics, you know, it's tactility, uh, that hands-onness of it and the traditional or analog aspects of it. Many of us ceramists um, find ourselves interacting just like we are now. Um, in new digital ways. And like so, the online exhibition, uh, the online adaption of Peters Valley present has lent new opportunities and meaning to this exhibition to me. Uh, and I hope to you as well. And it has invited more folks uh, to interact with the show much more than what was possible for the original three day exhibition. So, well, we look forward to seeing one another there again in person on campus and hopefully back in this very studio at Peters Valley. Um, this time is also offered a feeling that being present is not just about the physical presence. Instead, um, you know, I'd like to offer that being socially apart, and especially something that we're learning right now, being socially apart can be a compassionate and communal act offering us new ways to stay connected until the future. So 
in the spirit and maybe even the vulnerability that may come with that. I'd like to discuss with you um, my background, my path from making ceramics and essentially committing myself to thinking through clay, uh, not just as a maker, but also as a researcher. And I also hope to offer in this practice of mine, offer academia, I guess you could say, a way to think about culture at large through the material. And that's a lot, <laughs> but it is my hope. Um, so first I'll share a bit about myself and my ceramic work, discuss this shift and engagement in researching ceramics and the decision to pursue graduate school. Um, I'll also discuss some projects that I'm looking at right now and artists that have inspired me and ultimately how I try to harmonize life as a maker and researcher. So as you can see, everything for me stems from family. My mother on the left, um, looking at the left picture here, uh, her name's Barbara Bohuniak, and my dad on the right is Hugo Herrera Jr. And you could see them holding my best friend and older brother, Hugo III. And my parents met in Peekskill, New York, or is, which is where I still base myself. And um, my parents met there. And my mother's side and parents were also born in Peekskill um, to immigrant parents from Poland and England. And meanwhile, my dad's family also came to Peekskill uh, in the 70s from Hong Kong, Ecuador, and uh, about the time when he was 14 years old. So on the right of pictures from January, um, I was getting married here and this picture, I remember it being so important and joyful for me. My parents divorced when I was six years old and there's not a lot of memory that, um, or memory of them just together. And I remember this picture being so novel and I don't think I've had a picture with them together, uh, let alone on their laps since they divorced. So I bring this up because I feel like I have been brought up simultaneously in, in kind of two different environments. During the week, it would be with my mother in uh, rural, rural New York in Red Hook, which is a predominantly white area. And then on the weekends being brought up in a diverse neighborhood like Peekskill, New York, where I continue to base myself, which is a little city that ha still has a large Ecuadorian community. And consistently in my life, others tended to point out that uh, I didn't look like my parents or even that I looked ethnically ambiguous and asking what are you uh, was pretty common and, and pretty abundant. So I identify as Latina, uh, aware of and uh, aware of colorism and racism that is within the Ecuadorian American community, Latin American culture in the US. And I quickly realized that I will not experience the day-to-day -day life that comes with being my mom or being my dad, especially as I grew up and witnessed um, strangers confronting my mother and father, asking her, you know, if she, I was adopted or differently and more painfully at times when, you know, I was alone with my father confronting him and wondering what that relationship was. So I was always very aware of that dynamic um, of where I came from and I continue to look up to both of my parents for their grace and elegance in truly strenuous situations. But I'm also very thankful for, well, I'm giving me this, this sense of open conversation and um, deep consideration for folks outside of my own lived experience. And excuse me, I went to SUNY Potsdam on the border of Canada for undergraduate school. I was pursuing art history and ceramics. It's actually at this time in 2014 that I went to my first craft institution outside of college and I was just starting my romance with clay I'd taken some classes, but you know, barely approached the vessel form. And um, I remember uh, an instructor of mine, I, I had told them that I 
I was curious about putting faces on pots and he told me to check out June Kaneko's work and I asked who is that and I remember his eyes going wide and and probably the thought like how did she get in this class and I got in the workshop because I received one a few scholarships by, for minorities and at the time I had not met any person of color in my classes nor were there any that accompanied me at Haystack. I remember feeling rather alone that I should have been better than, than what I was, um, should have known more and worse that I may have taken someone's spot. And it's that discomfort and that worry of taking up space that I still toy with in my mind because for me, I started to ask the question and realize the impact of, of simply asking, you know, what if my first years in ceramics and in craft had been surrounded by other people of color? And um, this brings me to the color network. And, and little did I know that there were seeds already planted um, to answer this question. And so the color network was officially formed in 1991 disbanded in 2007 and it was founded in response to the scarce vi visibility of black ceramics. Artists within that group were Winnie Owens Hart, Ellen Day, um, Patsy Cox, and Paul Andrew Wandless and luckily enough um, Paul Andrew Wandless is also within this exhibition. His work's fantastic and so a short few late few years later after my first steps in craft and that concern that I had first, um, the color network kind of reanimated and um, in 2018 to assist the developing, uh, the, the development of emerging ceramics of color. Artists in the group include many that I still look up to today. Um, Natalia Arbelis, April Felipe, Salvador Jimenez Flores, Adam Chow and Yinka Orakadia. I'm constantly amazed at this community that they created this database and the programming. And I really hope that you all check this out as well. So it's about 2017 when I'm um, a few years out of school working for the Marx Project while volunteering at um, Bixco Clay Studios as a sort of assistant, mixing glazes for the studio and working on um, the next few pieces that I'll show you. Um, this is a cup from 2017. I used to make these um, simple cups because I've, I've come to realize that maybe they felt a little safe for me. There were some problem solving aspects that I liked, like thinking about ergonomics and the hand around the form and uh, just how I would interact with the piece, which are all thoughts that I still bring to different practices. And But every time I would make these pieces, I would flip it over and sign with like this quickly sketched face and my initials and I really soon found that I liked the bottom of the pot more than what I was making. Um, so I started putting faces on my pots uh, but also diary entries and I've come to realize that I have a, a rather large diary journal note making practice. Um, and it started to feel natural to put my diary entries on my pots. For a few months, I would treat my vessels like notebooks and add sketches and faces that were not planned in any way. And I loved this practice, especially in a shared studio space. Um, sometimes they were funny or um, maybe the, the pieces were uh, a little off-putting, uh, but I always hope that they were relatable in some way. I just like the idea too of making my insecurities like physical uh, and aesthetic and utilitarian. And so this piece it says, because uh, sometimes it can be hard to decipher that uh, the script, I'm not so sure of what I want, but I move forward. I've been making and changing. I, uh, well, a lot of the time, it can feel like a mistake, but I'm compelled to make them. So I do, 
and can I just say I'm happier? And let's see. I don't have these pieces anymore. Um, I sold them all <laughs> or I in, at times destroyed them. Um, this one says, I don't want to be vague. I want to look you in the eye and be see-through, but I'm not sure if I can because I want to be good to you and whether or not I deserve it, I, I won't. And I love you too much, truly. And, you know, these are our conversations that are kind of normal for me to have in my diaries. I never thought that I'd really talk about my diaries, um, but I often write to a you, um, the person that I'm hoping to really kind of suss out a conversation with. And um, this continued for a few months. And, you know, I also started doing something else that, that um, was uncomfortable for me. I started trying um, to learn Spanish in, well, also on my pots. And, uh, you know, these connotations of selling and destroying these diary entries, the vulnerability, the insecurities of it, I, I still really love, but I don't make things like this anymore. But I also came to a point where I didn't feel like it was authentic of me to use this color scheme, blue and white. And for me, it felt, you know, at a certain point inappropriate, um, especially after looking to artists who, who use this color scheme to discuss their own heritage. And when I think of that, I think of artists like Jennifer Ling Dachuk and Adam Chow um, and how they use various historic ceramic motifs and techniques and all to explore what Jennifer Ling Dachuk describes as this in-betweenness and Adam Chow, this limbo of being between and from multiple cultures. And, you know, I certainly am empathetic and, and feel that as well. So I came to realize that this color choice was not a strong or, or decisive one for, for myself. And I'm still really fond of these pieces and I really love them, especially as a practice in something I would really like to talk about, which is owning mistakes. Um, especially as you see here, like the practice of Spanish on my pots. And this one also, you know, just changing relationships and breaking up with someone or the love involved in that and some love that dissipates during it. And you know, I was in this piece discussing the song of Alero Sabor a Mi, which, you know, it, in the song, it discusses, you know, having the presence of someone for so long that the flavor of someone kind of uh, gets infused into you. Um, in a way. Um, and making those mistakes, be it in the Spanish grammar or, or um, whatever sense, um, I like this idea of making them concrete and not shying away from that process of learning and mistake making and hopefully just um, making in general. Because I, I did at times reclaim these pots and, and not want to fire them because they were rather vulnerable for me. So as I started this change of work and aesthetic uh, in my uh, making practice, I was in a bit of a crossroads between pursuing an MFA for ceramics or partaking in a newer curiosity of mine, ceramic research. And I've been trying to find pictures that illustrate my time uh, with the Marx Project but so often it's like right in front of a computer. So you'll see a lot of laptop shots. Um, but I, ultimately I felt like I needed to work out some agreements and core values of mine before I took out on, on that or either path. And pursuing graduate school in the arts felt really bold and differently. It felt really, really privileged and, and new especially growing up in a way that I did. And I mean, my mother, she did, she did everything for us. And, but you know, financial security was never something I experienced. And 
my mom made and my dad, they both made so many compromises to, to let me get me to even go to undergrad. And um, so the idea of going to school for something that no one in my family had yet partaken in was a big leap for me. And I also wondered where my voice might be most useful. And ultimately I chose to pursue my master's in history of design and curatorial studies at Parsons. Um, I research what I do, not just for myself though, that always felt really important, um, but for all, all those like my family and friends um, who are very materially and emotionally intelligent, who if only interpretations and representations of themselves were extended in the material or, or the study or different curatorial projects even, they'd absolutely be interested. And so, you know, out of everyone, they continue to be those who I trust most as I work through various projects. Um, so a lot of my day, uh, a lot of my days look like this. Uh, before the pandemic, my husband and I lived in Peekskill, um, and he would drive me to the train at 7.30 in the morning, uh, and he'd go up the river to Kingston as I headed down, to the, down the river to school. And so we'd both be in the, our cars or trains over an hour just to get one, one way uh, to the places that we needed to be. And my husband, he's a mechanic, and his family has been at, um, at it in Kingston for just about over 20 years and they just bought their own property to expand their business. And as he would be working all day, uh, and I would be in school all day and we'd finally get home and meet back at the train right at 7.30 p.m. And, and I miss him so much. Um, so in the pictures, I'm studying here for an exam making flashcards. And Daniel here is, is fixing cars and, and killing it in the, in the auto shop. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the balance of being a maker pursuing academic studies. Um, for a while, being a maker and academic did not really align comfortably, and sometimes it still doesn't but I have chosen to straddle them like I try to with other dichotomies in the world, uh, in my world, the dualism that comes with being Ecuadorian American. And I often felt like personal narrative, I mean, which was so apparent in my ceramic work was not legitimate in academic writing. And I think that is, is changing. And, and maybe to, Accelerate change, you know, sometimes you just simply have to do it. And I think that ceramics provides a wonderful opportunity, and I'm very biased, but um, I think it provides a wonderful opportunity and lens to work through different aspects of just being human. And from a personal space for me, I mean, I think that the material, the potential of it, it's molding, the making of it, and with it uh, was for me intuitive and healing and emotional. And that doesn't mean it has to be for everyone, but I, I say this because I, I would like to extend that being in tune or sympathetic to material can untap the potential of understanding and appreciation, not only for others work, but also other people. So this slide, you know, it has a few of my current projects or past ones. Um, Right now I'm working with uh, Christina De Leon. She's a Latino design curator um, at the Cooper Hewitt and helping build um, a Latin American design wish list to further acquire works at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, amazing to me is finding, you're seeing above in the center, um, a work by Lady Pink, which was one of my very first projects um, in a class of mine. This poster is from a book project called Your House is Mine. And um, it, well, Lady Pink is 
I just chose this piece, but um, she is an Ecuadorian American like me. She came to the States just like my father at the same time period. And um, she's a graffiti artist and started tagging at 15 on the subways in the city. Um, and, you know, it's amazing that, and, and really affirming that within the Cooper Hewitt still and, and in these new experiences that, you know, I still find, find ways to connect um, to be my Ecuadorianness and, and or just concerns of accessible making that comes with making poster art or graffiti and different projects. So below that you see um, a snapshot of a different presentation I had made um, about historic porcelain uh, and how makers are reanimating um, different techniques or, or motifs or simply engaging with it in a social way. And um, so artists that I had already discussed, Adam Chow, um, Jennifer Lingdachuk, and Roberto Lugo, um, all with powerful works that continue to inspire me. And I always love how socially engaged they are. Um, last, you know, I don't have a picture of it because it's always on the computer, but I'm also working on um, kind of looking into the Sika Emerging Artist Award winners. Um, I've gotten as far as 1995 and I've always been curious about whether the feelings that I felt early on in craft and ceramics were um, well also reciprocated in any sort of systemically racist way um, and so I've been looking into that and, and kind of how sparse um, diversity has been within uh, at least that context. And so that last project, you know, it brings me to maybe something a little bit odd when I'm talking about ceramics, but um, I read a lot of uh, sci-fi, fantasy, and Afrofuturist novels. And um, I think I have come to really need them, especially right now during all of these changes and upheavals. And if you're looking for for a positive future, I really suggest that you look at um, the work of N.K. Jemison and Octavia Butler and, and the like. Um, but I think, uh, well, I just finished reading the Broken Earth Trilogy and by N.K. Jemison. And most recently I opened up Parable of the Sour by Octavia Butler. And I was really happy to find that Jemison had written a forward in she writes that um, about reading the book during a career specific encounter with institutional racism. And uh, she writes, by this time I'd begun to understand just how rare and how strange and the mere idea of thinking about the future was for those of us from marginalized backgrounds. Worse, I'd seen how complicit science fiction and fantasy were and making our future so hard to imagine. There was time for this change and we weren't really asking for much from our fellow writers, just more than European myths in our fantasy and more than token representations in future, present and past. And so I think that many of us and, and you know me, I've been yearning and I have been working towards that future where representation of marginalized folks becomes present in the future, present and past of ceramics and craft. And I hope to further that scholarship and representation. Before, I did feel like it was hard to imagine a future for me in ceramics and in research. But I feel so affirmed by, by the makers that are here and inspiring me and the color network and thankful for those mentors who continue to tell me that my perspective and concern is important. And so with that, you know, <laughs> uh, just icebreaker, um, I have to thank the squad. <laughs> um, thank you, Peters Valley, um, Kristen, Grace, Bruce, Brienne, Jennifer and Rachel for having me and 
continuing to be a support to me in the past year. Um, and then of course my family and friends, my mom, dad, Daniel, my husband, and my best friends, Jordan and Julia. And I'd really like to thank a, a mentor of mine, Marisa Scotch, who when discussing the topic of my presentation, she just told me to, to go for it and to own it and, and to believe in myself. And I really appreciate her input. So thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. If anyone has questions, please um, pop them into the Q&A. Um, uh, can you hear me? Just want to make sure. Can you hear me, Carolyn? Mm -hmm. Okay, just wasn't sure. If I'm <laughs> sipping water. <laughs> okay. um, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, Thank you for being so authentic. I think that's something that we all need. And um, I, I can relate on many levels to what you're saying as somebody who lives in the space in between as a maker and as an administrator, as an immigrant, as a child of two very different ethnicities. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, a really interesting time for you to be in the curatorial studies. And I think um, while, while certainly art history and pursuing the arts seems of privilege, it's so necessary to elevate voices and rewrite the story by not really eliminating a story. It's just building on the story, right? Like adding, adding another perspective. So I think that's, you know, really great. And, um, I can't wait to see what more you do with this and the opportunities of being at the new museum and the Parsons and the program, which is so strong. And I'm sure it will provoke you and push you yeah. in, to new levels. And, um, and thank you so much. Um, I've got a question here. Cool. Enjoyable presentation. May I ask about the materials you use? Sustainable? Are you involved with any associations that follow or are using natural projects? Products, products. Yeah, I think that back when I was um, making, it was always, for the most part, porcelain. Um, and I, you know, I think that I'm way more in tune with with the environmental impact of of what ceramics is but back then I certainly was not um, I think sadly the most that was um, reclaiming clay and being very very choosy about what I fired but it also you know I know the questions for me but Chris I was wondering if you have any any feedback on that question about uh, well I you know, it's really interesting because I wood fire and I burn trees, right? But, but there are trees that are felled by professionals and I fire once a year. So there's like a concentration of energy. Yeah. But, uh, um, so, and there's been some research on the CO2 and all of that. It's complicated. I, I think that our, our living and breathing is, has an impact on, on the environment and, uh, I certainly, I, I think there's a point of, with ceramics, you really are working with natural materials, not synthetic materials, and we reclaim everything, right? We, we have the ability, and so the idea that you would recycle your work when you're not happy with it or uncomfortable with it is, is one step in the direction of making sure it doesn't last for two million years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, same, same here, like, the, the reclaiming of it when I was making um, was constant. Um, and then, you know, now I, I actually knit a lot. Um, and it's not something I've gotten to, to tap into is, is the eco aspect of it. Um, I'm hoping to learn more as, as I continue learning about the process of, of you know, sheep to sweater, essentially. Like, so that's where I'm at on that. Um, Missy Stevens has a question. I'm curious about what color palette you came to when you moved away from blue and white and what felt more authentic? 
Oh, thanks. Um, I think I have a picture here. Um, you know, I started looking at um, yellow, blue, and red. Um, I always loved the primary colors of it. And I remember making or painting actually early on before I was doing ceramics and um, and it was always very vibrant. And so I kind of went back into that, those primary colors uh, that also so happened to be on the Ecuadorian flag. <laughs> so um, it kind of went there for a bit. And um, I think that differently, um, something that looking into ceramic history has, has offered me is a, a consistent wondering of, you know, why am I attracted to, to what I am and uh, be it colors and, and whatnot. And, you know, is that, is that, um, does that go deep into other cultures or where is that coming from? Because sometimes things um, kind of feel natural, but, you know, in the sense of why I was using blue and white, you know, I had seen it a lot and it felt like, like an automatic decision, but um, having or seeing other decisive choices changed my mind about using it. But all that to say, way more vibrant now, um, yellow, blue, and red. <laughs> well, I, I just want to point out that the background behind you matches the work you make, which is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so I was like, look at that. Um, but I, I also find it interesting how we've, in, in here we've commodified identity. Hmm. Oh, and, and that's like a really big question for me as someone that um, has, you know, uh, multiple backgrounds and it's like, well, what do you identify with? You, you can be a stranger everywhere. It just depends yeah. where you're standing. And, and it is really interesting um, that we're, we're like, when you think about globalization, I think porcelain is a great example of how it moved through the world as this new, highly technologically advanced object um, and material, and everybody tried to mimic it. Yeah, you know, and and how <clears throat> through the history now it's it, it's uh, representational. Yes, um, I think that the luxury aspect of porcelain is a really interesting one too. Um, a different thing that I'm. I'm fascinated by it is the use of clay body as a symbol for culture as well. You know, artists who use terracotta or or um, porcelain or stoneware and, and one that feels right for them. And ultimately, you know, I think that what I make now, uh, it's just to have the utmost decisiveness and to know why I'm making the decisions that I am. Um, that is really important to me. Yeah. Thank you. So Michelle Gans had another question. Clay and their elements, are there some better than others that you find more durable or pliable? So mm. clays that are more durable and pliable that you prefer to work with? I, I really like, um, you know, there's some, I'm, I'm bad. I'm like, I think everything's great, but, <laughs> um, I would say that my least favorite clay is this, Kristen, have you ever heard of B-Mix? Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's so strange. Yeah. It's so, it's like, this sense, it feels synthetic and I've never, um, when you reclaim it, um, the, and put it in a pug mill if you need to. It just like you add water to it, and it just does not soak up the water, and it sloshes around. And um, but I hear it's really pliable and like kind of looks like porcelain in a way. But I, that's one that I wouldn't wouldn't enjoy. But I think all all clay bodies are really really wonderful. Um, I I think that. Next, I, I'd like to get it back into like a red stoneware that's really groggy and that's very durable. Yeah, I think that the difference is that the highly processed clays, our, our clay minerals now are, are really small particles and they're made for industry. 
oh. we're a consumer and so we have highly refined materials so our ancestors do not have that and they're yeah much more open and um will receive water a little easier but yeah does anyone have any other questions if not um in the chat i think we posted carolyn's website her instagram um join us next wednesday because we will have the opening reception for the um peters valley present exhibition that um now can reach a much larger audience and thank you so much carolyn and thank you everyone for tuning in it was really exciting to see people from all over including a retired ranger from the delaware water gap nice so very exciting thank you thanks so much bye everybody